Dunedin, our Kotu Katoa. Welcome everyone to this meeting of the Dunedin City Council. Welcome to councillors, to staff, to the public and to the media. Our um, prayer today, or our opening, uh, is going to be led by Adrian Hines, who's the chair of the Dunedin Interfaith Council. Kia ora. Oh my God, oh my God, unite the hearts of thy servants and reveal to them thy great purpose. May they follow thy commandments and abide in thy law. Help them, O oh God, in their endeavour and guide their steps by the light of thy knowledge and cheer their hearts by thy love. Verily thou art their helper and their Lord. Right, Adrian. We move on now to the meeting proper. Um, we have apologies for lateness from um, Councillor Steadman, and I'll move that Council accepts the apology for lateness of Councillor Steadman. Second, Councillor Staines. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. I'll further move um, item four that, that Council confirms the agenda uh, with the following alterations. In regard to Standing Order 2.1, option C be adopted in relation to moving and seconding and speaking to amendments and that items C5, that's the Annual Review, DCC, Treasury Risk Management Policy and C6, Dunedin's City Council's Letter of Expectations, Expectation of Dunedin City Holdings Limited, be considered in the public part of the meeting following item 22. So that's bringing those two items from the non-public part into the public part. Second to Councillor Staines. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. Okay, declarations of interest. Um, we're all reminded of the need to stand aside from decision making when a conflict arises. Um, now we're noting in this instance, in the instance of this meeting, um, Councillor Gary has declared an interest in item 16 and will not participate in this item. Um, and I note you've sat back from the public forum presentation. Uh, Councillor Wilson has declared an interest in the Fulden Ma item uh, and has not received any papers relating to the item and will not be present when this is considered. And Councillor Laufiso has provided an updated register of interest uh, which will not affect any participation at this meeting and will be updated uh, for the next. So, with those um, provisos, um, I'll move that Council notes the elected member's interest register attached as attachment one, confirms the proposed management plan for elected member's interest and notes the executive leadership team member's interest register as attachment B. Seeing the Councillor Staines, all those in favour please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. <coughs> Excuse me. Confirmation minutes, item six. Uh, I'll move uh, that the council confirms the public part of the minutes of the ordinary council meeting held on the 30th of July 2019 is a correct record. Second to Councillor Staines. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Minutes of committees. Um, Toy to Otago Settlers Museum Board. Someone would like to move. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. I'll move that the minutes of the Toy to Otago Settlers Museum Board meeting held on the 3rd of April and the 3rd of July are noted. Second, Councillor Lord. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Item uh, 9, since that covered 7 and 8, uh, Councillor Wilson, Infrastructure Services and Networks. Oh, Councillor O'Malley. Um, I note, um, move that the Council notes the minutes of the Infrastructure Services Network Committee meeting held on 5th of August 2019. Second. Councillor Newell. Any discussion? Put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Against? Carried. Keep, item 10, Community and Culture. Councillor Hawkins. Can I call your worship? I'll move that the minutes of the Community and Culture Committee meeting held on the 6th of August 2019 be confirmed. Is that better? Second to Councillor Elder. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Planning and Environment Committee, Councillor Benson Pope. 
Thank you, Worship. I move that Council note the planning and invite the minutes of the Planning and Environment Committee meeting of 6th of August 2019. And it's Councillor Newell that's seconding. Any discussion? I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? Carried. <coughs> minutes of the Community Boards. Councillor Wiley. Uh, thank you, Worship. I move that the Council notes the uh, Wakawai Coast Community Board 19th of June. Moleskill Tyree Community Board, 26th of June, Saddle Hill Community Board, 27th of June, and West Harbour Community Board, 21st of August. Second to Councillor Lord. Any discussion on any of those? <coughs> I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Right. We move straight on to um, the, the reports proper. Uh, item 16, application to extend urban water supply boundary. Uh, can I invite Mr. Drew and Mr. Campbell? Welcome. Do you um, wish to introduce this in any way? Um, no, we're happy to take questions. Just Right, so we'll, we'll kick off with uh, questions, councillors, and there may be some uh, given the uh, submission that we've just heard. So this is timely. Um, now, just to let you know, um, the letter circulated for this report is non-public to protect the privacy of the owner. So leave that out of the discussion. Um, and we'll open it up for questions. Councillor Benson Pike. Thank you. Well, the report, um, as it stands, is pretty unequivocal, um, but there's been some matters raised that aren't covered entirely in or reported on in that report today by the submitter. Uh, can you tell us uh, any information that you might have about the surrounding properties and the claims that were made, and whether or not they are also connected or not to the stormwater, to the foul water system, please? Um, in terms of the surrounding properties, there is one surrounding property that is not serviced, a neighbouring property, um, and then the others are, and um, they were all considered um, under a different set of criteria because they were existing pre-2011, which is what the bylaw allows for water, supply and, for water supply, and I don't have the foul sewer information in front of me, but I can take that on notice if you would like. Further questions? Councillor Vandervis. Is it still the case that when considering a connected water supply that you also see it desirable because of the extra water used that a proper connected sewage supply also be part of the package? Yes, so the paper doesn't um, mention that but that um, for environmental reasons it can be seen that a water supply could increase water use and therefore um, wastewater discharge. So it um, can be preferable for um, connection to sewage where there is connection to water, but it's not always the case. But I understand that it's not always the case and that you've made clear that it's preferable. But just to be clear, is it council policy now that for new water connections, you also uh, uh, required to have a wastewater connection as well. I'm not clear. We can take that on advice and we'll go back and confirm that. My understanding it's different for different zonings. Thank you very much for that. But I follow up on that because I think um, Councillor Van has made a good point and you might want to inquire as to whether a connection for water supply might be allowed with a restricted quantity if there is no uh, wastewater system in place to get around the risk of too much water being used. Uh, further questions? Councillor Benson Park. Central motion, Mr Chairman. I mean, I think clearly there's information we need that's not in the report. Some of it's been raised, some of it's just been confirmed. I'll therefore move that this matter lie on the table to be further reported on. Is there a seconder for that? Councillor Hawkins? Okay. Now, just clarifying, as a procedural motion, I... Yes, thank you. 
Can I just, um, I guess, talk to the report a wee bit about the decision that staff have come to? It's, it, just a minute. Well, oh, sorry. Just hold while I get advice. Motion is that it lie on the table. Had you spoken to this matter, Councillor Benson Pope? No, we we're not even in. Dis we're not in discussion. Yet. Right, so the situation is it's been moved and seconded. It is a procedural motion, there's, so there's no discussion. Um, so I'm, I'm going to put it, all those in favour, and it'll be quite clear um, that this is to lay the matter on the table until uh, the next appropriate occasion when more pro um, uh, this information has been supplied. That's the motion. So all those in favour, please say aye. aye. Against? It's carried. Okay, we'll go on to um, item 17, Mosgill Memorial Park, um, approval to grant easements. Um, I think Mr West, Mr Graham. Oh, yeah, right, so we'll just hold for, eh? Um, Councillor Benson, uh, Councillor Vandervis, did you? I was just going to say to the move. Oh, right, well, I'll... I'll Note that, and we'll come back to it. There may be some questions. Okay, um, item 17. Are there, do you wish to introduce this, or just go straight to questions? Questions, councillors. Is there any? Are there any questions here? There are, don't appear to be any. It's been moved, as as in the order paper, councillor Vandervis. Is there a second to Councillor Hall? Do you wish to speak to this, Councillor Vandervis? Does anybody wish to speak to this? That being the case, I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Ag against? Carried. Thank you for your attendance. <laughs> right. Item 18, Housing Action Plan for Dunedin, 2019-2039. Update. Mr Christie, Ms Gunn, Mr Coffey. Um, do you wish to introduce this or just go straight to questions? Or straight to questions? Councillors, Councillor Hawkins, we're in questions. Happy to move. Right. You, you, you're indicating you're happy to move? Okay, well I'll record that. Um, are there any questions? Sorry, I, I missed... 18, yeah, Housing Action Plan. Okay. Uh, are there any quick Councillor Alder. Um, just a question. Um, Gail, you mentioned that you're going to Levin and um, wondering if there would be any opportunity for workshops on um, options available? Or, yeah. With the chair. As part of the process, I'm sure that the um, city development team will have options when they've, they're having individual discussions at the moment with individual planners and people making suggestions, and then options will come through later on. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'm particularly interested in item 13. Um, and I wanted to know what your definition of a developer was in this regard. Are we talking developers who do this all the time, or does this include mom and pop developer who are subdividing off a section from their <coughs> property? Thank you, Councillor. We did have discussion around that, and we referred to the Building Act that says anyone, um, was it the term is sleeping accommodation? So yes, we were looking at the mum and pop plus the larger developers who do it at the time. Our philosophy is, is we are keen to have more houses built in the city and more sleeping accommodation, so it was anyone we'd like to work with. Thank you, and uh, forgive me if I've missed this, but the timing of the Navigator 
position. Could you just? Um, we'll be advertising that within the next two weeks. Fantastic. Thank you. Councillor Wiley. Um, thank you. Uh, a question. Um, I don't know which one to, who to direct this to, but uh, paragraph 10. Um, on the 13th of June, the DCC Property Group hosted a public housing development forum. Like, what was the attendance like? Do we, did you keep minutes and things like that? Or is this essentially the summary of it? Uh, we don't have a written summary of it. It um, we was a mixed attendance from community housing providers, so CHIPS, uh, developers, landowners, um, and government organisations. Anecdotally, we've had some feedback from <coughs> the government organisations that um, they are, they've had some further discussions with some developers, but because that's that's not within our purview to to f um, continue those discussions. Those discussions are with MHUD. Uh, we we are not intimately involved in them. But overall, I think that people felt they got the information that they required, and it was clear what council does and doesn't do, and what MHUD, uh, so the Ministry of Housing and Urban Development, I do apologise for the short terminology, um, what they can offer in terms of funding and support for housing developers. So did you send out like 100 invites and you have 30 people attend or something like that? I'm, I'm just getting a gauge of the interest from those that were invited. Yeah, I think there were about 50 to 60 people in the room. I think most people that we invited actually did attend. Um, those that didn't um, or haven't have actually, you know, there have been further meetings with some developers who didn't attend that day. So, yeah. Further questions? Councillor Alden. Just one I forgot to ask. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, the government is putting in new legislation around um, intensity, heights, etc., and also um, rural land around high-class soils. So, will that impact on um, this? And is there any um, information, kind of seminars, that we can get down here to look at what that, the implications of those might be? The, um, there's several phases to the MHUD setting up. So currently they've put through legislation that's allowed them to exist, and what we're expecting as a second tranche of legislation is, is what the council is talking about, is to making some changes and giving that author them, them authority to, to um, operate in special housing areas. Um, and that information isn't out yet. We don't know what that will look like. There have been half a dozen um, <coughs> information sheets put out, basically, indicating a direction, but uh, we don't know if that is the direction. So we have to wait till that, unfortunately, that legislation comes out before we can do anything, and then there'll be, unfortunately, a very brief time, as usual, with central government for us to make submissions to that. And I just further point out that both the pieces of proposed legislation that you mentioned, the product, productive soils, highly productive soils uh, one, and the um, urban development one, are out for consultation. They're not out as proposed legislation right now. They are out for consultation. So it's, it makes it even more important for um, councils uh, and the sector in general to comment on those because they uh, they impact on us uh, considerably, or potentially do. Now, um, are there any other questions? No other questions. Would someone like to move um, the Councillor Hawkins, second to Councillor Gary? Do you wish to speak to it? Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, well, do thank you, Your Worship, and uh, thank you to the staff for bringing this uh, this paper to us. I think it was uh, timely. There's been some commentary in the public sphere over the past couple of weeks about what it is that council could do to make it easier for residential development to occur. Um, of course, at our, at our meeting on the 6th of May, as is outlined in this paper, uh, council adopted all the recommendations uh, in the Housing Action Plan, one of which was uh, the appointment of staff specifically tasked with helping residential developers navigate uh, the resource consent and building consent uh, process. Uh, 
Um, we obviously didn't make enough of a big deal about that. Uh, so it's great that we've had this opportunity to have this back on the agenda uh, to, to, discuss, uh, to discuss that, and even better that uh, we're in the recruitment phase uh, and that we'll have those people on board. That is a request that came specifically from the development community uh, at our <coughs> housing summit to have, uh, to have this function. Uh, the Mayor's Task Force for Housing took that on board as a recommendation. A council then adopted that uh, and then funded it, and it's finally happening. Um, I'd like to add my thanks uh, in the interim <coughs> Uh, to Mr Christie and Ms Gunn in particular who have been doing this work uh, on top of everything else that they do in terms of um, brokering relationships and building relationships with developers and community housing providers and social service agencies and fielding a fairly significant number of inquiries uh, from people who are all very interested in what council can do to help their developments get off the ground uh, as you would imagine when you, uh, when you, when you ask around. Um, so it's great to have this update. There's still plenty of work that needs to be done to give effect to the Housing Action Plan in its entirety. Uh, there's, there's further pieces of work going on, obviously, the variation on the 2GP around urban development capacity, uh, the, the, the rules forthcoming around uh, density uh, and the protection of um, productive soils uh, that have been mentioned. Uh, we still have uh, a shortage of public housing, obviously. Uh, but in particular, I think um, the, the issues around advocacy whereby uh, council was or accepted the challenge of advocating to government for change in areas that are outside of our direct control around like the enforcement of rental standards that are coming in and making sure that the enforcement is adequately resourced around um, uh, lifting the levels for the income related rents uh, subsidy around <coughs> making improvements to the building code those things uh, take a while and I acknowledge that those are uh, political discussions that need to be led uh, politically and can't be left up to staff uh, to push that. I think that's, that's likely to be how we're going to get the best outcome. Uh, so that's a, a challenge for uh, the incoming council to pick up and run with. Uh, I think it's, these things uh, do take time and I do hope uh, that the importance of this work does, uh, does carry forward. And I'd like to uh, specifically thank you, uh, Your Worship, for uh, the leadership that you've shown and the work that you've done around housing in particular. Uh, we've been well served uh, to have, that, uh, to have uh, that mana behind this work. So thank you uh, for that. And thank you, staff, again, for the update on this work. Well, thank you for doing the work that I started. <laughs> <coughs> Any other speakers? Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I wanted to echo uh, my colleague's comments um, and, and particularly acknowledge his contribution and leadership in this regard. Um, it was very interesting attending the HUI um, and I want to just uh, focus on a couple of matters, although I understand that the uh, housing action plan is a great deal wider than this. And the two things I just want to focus on are the navigator position, uh, because it's been a long-held view of mine, uh, backed up by my own personal experience, uh, and also that of a constituent, uh, that this will be a hugely helpful matter. There are people out there in our community who are not experienced developers, but perhaps have a bit of land, but too much land on their property, and for whatever reason, be it health or retirement or whatever, or to generate some extra funding for their families, are considering uh, subdividing off pieces of land. <clears throat> uh, but really, uh, the experience and the possibility of the process seems just far too hard. And I think the idea of having a navigator is going to be hugely beneficial to that. Um, we have the model of the red carpet uh, project and how well that worked, um, and this green carpet approach I think is going to work particularly well, but particularly well for those who are not as familiar, and that's why I asked the question, not as familiar with the development pr uh, process as some are. For the um, very experienced developers uh, listening at the HUI, I believe this will be a very welcome uh, development as well and very timely. Um, the other matter that I want to turn my attention to is rentals, and I welcome all of the regulations that are underway and the various initiatives. Uh, but I do note that we still have a huge power imbalance between landlords and tenants, and we have some ways to go um, to empower tenants to feel they're able to raise matters with their landlords around non-compliance and the issues that happen with that, particularly for some of our most vulnerable uh, in our city. Um, so congratulations to all of those who've uh, 
uh, got to this point and have put the work into this point, uh, including colleagues and staff. Um, a job well done. Any other speakers? There are none. I take it you don't want to exercise your right of reply so quickly. So, well, I'm going to put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? <coughs> Carried. Okay, thank you, team. Item 19, um, Dunedin Town Hall, formalisation of reserve status, reserve classification. I think we've got Ms Graham, Mr Bainbridge and Ms Sleeman. Hmm? Okay, do you wish to intro this? No, oh, just to um, note that we recirculated a correct map. Fine. So just, is everyone aware that um, there's a, a corrected map being circulated for this? So if you, if you don't have that, put your hand up. So we'll go straight into questions, councillors. Councillor Vanders. In the uncorrected map, we had the area bounded by the town hall, almost all of Harrop Street, and the curtilage facing Philol Street uh, as the area of concern. In the new map, we still have all of the town hall uh, area, which I understand, but we also still have, curiously, most of, but not all of, Harrop Street. Why is it? that we've included most of, but not all of, Harrop Street in this reserve proposal. Uh, just through the chair, um, this area is part of a very old area of reserve, um, and Harrop Street's included in it. So that area all has to be, um, is all the area of reserve that needs to be classified. So you say that Harrop Street is included in it. Are you saying that the reason that we have most of, but not all of Harrop Street included, is that that was an original boundary that Harrop Street includes, but goes a bit beyond? That's correct. Right. Um, the reserve status, under the current record of title, it doesn't have the reserve status that we're proposing here. What I would like to know is what restrictions on future development and building in particular would reserve status of the area of Harrop Street involve? For instance, if we wanted to build a multi-level car park up against the side of the town hall, uh, would the reserve status of Harrop Street uh, present a considerable difficulty for that. My understanding is that we have to be very careful with reserve status because it does severely limit what you can do at a later date. And uh, just to uh, round out the question, having given a hypothetical example, which obviously I don't want to do because we can't afford it, um, is why don't we simply just make the area the footprint of the town hall and not include Harrop Street, so as not to complicate further possible development issues? Um, the reason that we're including this whole land area is because it's in one certificate of title or one record of title, so you can't separate it out. It's one parcel of land and one title. Well, you're saying you can't separate it out. Obviously you can, you simply make another title for it. Uh, it would require some considerable survey work, which would cost quite a lot of money. Um, I, uh, okay, uh, given that there is a cost involved in actually doing it in a way that simply reflects the footprint of the town hall, can you then address the issue of what future constraints having most of Harrop Street as reserve status places upon any future development? Can you clarify that a little bit for me, please? Um, under the Reserves Act, there's a whole lot of things that you're not allowed to do. Currently, as I understand it, the way it's currently zoned, if a hotel developer or whatever wanted to build something right next to the town hall that encroached onto the area of Harrop Street, even a small amount, he would be up against a real issue with this new designation of a reserve area. I, I think I've been as clear as I can be and that is, 
uh, as I understand it, um, including Harrop Street, creates future constraints. And these constraints may be considerable, they may be well in excess of the cost of actually having to survey Harrop Street and put on a separate title. So I'm just wondering what, in your opinion, those constraints might be. I'd like to know what kind of future developments <coughs> might be constrained by changing the reserve status of Harrop Street. Quite understand um, the, the town hall. And as a backup question to that, uh, given that the existing um, record of title doesn't accurately reflect the use of the land. Is there any real problem in maintaining a poorly reflected uh, record of title, given that it does give us more flexibility? Why go to the trouble uh, and possible expense and possible restriction under the Reserves Act of doing what is proposed in this paper? Why would we do it at all? The actual point of the report is that the land is already reserved. It's a historic piece of legislation. It just wasn't recorded on the title. So consequently, as part of that, we are just correcting something that was originally there. And as part of that, we are classifying it municipal and entertainment, which is what the area is used for at the moment. And if council were of a mind to exclude Harrop Street, then that is something open to them. But that would then, as um, Ms Sleeman has said, mean um, a process where we separated the titles. That may or may not be simple in this case, and um, we could look to do that, but that is not the staff recommendation. I, I, I understand and appreciate, uh, have just learned that it's possibly going to be quite expensive to separate off Harrop Street, uh, given that I'm keen not to have any extra expense. Can we then, uh, apart from it being nice to have it uh, appropriately uh, clarified in terms of what its record of title is, what is the actual advantage of having a clarified uh, record of title as opposed to the one that's just sat there historically and harmlessly for so long? Why are we actually doing this? That's in the report. Those reasons. Um, is, is one of them, as suggested by Councillor uh, Wilson, the granting of the easement for Aurora Energy? I would have thought that's that was absolutely correct, yes. Uh, can I just address, um, um, you make some good points, and, um, your point about the possibility that Parrop Street being in, included on the title might constrain the ability to develop the land. I suspect it might be the opposite, because if you recall when it was proposed that an atrium was to be built there, the only reason that that could be proposed was that that land is part of the town hall. Had that not been the case, uh, that proposed development couldn't have even been proposed. So the point I'm making is, including Harrop Street, actually, it could be argued that it actually enables development more than constrains it. That was, the, that was the case then anyway. Yeah, thank you very much for that explanation. I do remember that particular uh, argument and, and accept it entirely. Uh, that's for a particular kind of development. There is another kind of development, however, where, uh, and it was, has been suggested uh, many years ago when I was still on council, that uh, Harrop Street actually be closed off and that uh, one of the difficulties with closing off Harrop Street was that it was actually a street that you couldn't actually close off easily. Uh, my concern is that if we make it reserve status, it'll be much easier to close off. Um, and, uh, <coughs> and I don't actually see the advantage of, of having it one way or the other. If we want to build an atrium on the side of the, on the, side of the town hall and Harrop Street as a separate entity, um, I, I don't see that that is necessarily going to be a problem either. I'm just wondering why it is <coughs> we are doing this um, I'm not satisfied that the inclusion of Harrop Street is wise going into the future. I accept that you've given me uh, some answers to my questions, but I still feel some unease about vesting something in an official reserve. Uh, Councillor Wilson. Sorry, just in the move when it's appropriate. Uh, that, 
that we I was just indicating a willingness to move oh, I accordingly. Right, well, I'll keep that. Yeah. that. I'll just check that there's no more questions. Are there any more? Councillor Lord and then Councillor Hall. Yeah, I, I just um, was trying to still get an answer from, from Lee's question. If we did go to the trouble of subdividing that bit off, is there likely that it would, for example, be amalgamated in the future with the car park land and, and could be used for something else? Like, I can't answer that until we've done the work, Councillor, I'm sorry. Uh, so there's no, as far as you're concerned, if it does go into this reserve land today, could it in the future be taken back out of that or something? Well, can I just ask, I think to clarify that question, even if you made it a separate title, does that make it not a reserve? It's a reserve now, and it would remain a reserve. So it's not going to make it any easier. Uh, Councillor Hall. Okay, any further questions? Councillor Vandermas. Just the last one, and excuse me if it, it does sound like the same question. If it's a reserve now anyway, why are we doing this? That was explained earlier to one of your earlier questions. That it had been... It's regularising a situation that currently exists so that the title is clear. And so that it complies with the requirements of the Reserves Act 1977. So um, Maria's been involved in a whole process of regularising land where we have pieces of land that, w that we haven't dealt with well in the past, so putting, putting right errors or, or lapses in the past and getting things so that they are legal, so that they line up with legal requirements, that's exactly what this is, nothing more, nothing less. So there's been no issues with the way it's currently uh, been recorded and we are simply just wanting to get a bit of bureaucratic precision around We've it. identified that it, we don't currently comply with the law and it would be good to regularise that. Thank you. Uh, it's been moved. Councillor Wilson, second to Councillor Vincent Pope. Councillor Wilson, do you wish to speak to it? No. Any other speakers? Councillor Vandervis. The piece of land out the front that was on the original diagram is a bigger chunk actually than Harrop Street. The um, use to which it can be put, I would have thought, would also uh, fall under similar sort of ruling, although perhaps the area in front of the library and perhaps the area in front of the car park may not. Um, I'm wondering if there was an original intention as per our original paper to make the whole lot of it, the T-shape if you like, a reserve, and now that we're just doing a smaller part of it because that front curtilage uh, may have presented difficulties. Um, if that's the case, I still, re I, I still remain uh, <laughs> unconvinced that, um, that this is an ideal thing to be doing. Uh, I have to basically accept staff advice that there is not really any downside to doing this and it's a tidy up. Uh, but I then wonder about how are you going to tidy up the front piece of land that is to say the area between the town hall and Phillil Street, and why wouldn't you tidy that up at the same time as per the original paper? Because it, the original paper was wrong and it's not in the title, so we're not dealing with it, so it's irrelevant. Are there any other speakers? I'm going to put it. All those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. <coughs> okay, item 20, Animal Services Annual Report to the Department of Internal Affairs. Mr Pickford, Ms McGill and Mr Hanlon, I think. Welcome. Do you wish to introduce... So, no introduction. Questions, Councillor Gary. A somewhat tangential question, but very relevant <coughs> nonetheless. Um, are you aware that out in the community there is a commonly held view that if a dog bites somebody and they end up having an injury they have to go to hospital with, there is a commonly held view that hospital will report that and it's not up to the person who's the victim or anyone associated with it needs to do so because that's been dealt with otherwise. I've come across this several times and just the other day in fact. Um, and people aren't educated around the process of what they need to do and that other people don't report it, they have to. Are you aware of that?
Privacy Act. I'm reluctant to disclose any information pertaining to dog attacks, so it's up to the victim to make contact with us. So, so I understand that. Are you aware that people don't know that out in the community? Um, no, there's been no specific cases brought to my attention. Further questions? Councillor Alder. I note that there's been a decrease in infringements. Is, is there any kind of anecdotal evidence as to why this is happening? Or? <coughs> I think um, at the moment it shows there's a greater level of compliance from dog owners out there, which is a positive. That's great. And the other thing is, um, just curiosity really, is you do education in schools. Um, what does that entail? Does it entail teaching children how to relate to dogs or um, what's the specifics on that one? We have an officer that targets not only schools but other professional organisations as well. So she'll, um, her delivery will cater for the, from young children right to professional adults. Thank you, thank you, and and thank you. It's a positive report in the sense of re reduction in all areas where, where we would like them to be. Thank you. Any further questions, Councillor Wilson? Are oh, you just? No, no a question. Uh, yeah, question. Uh, just, I, I'm presuming from the number of pet dogs compared to, and we haven't got, unfortunately, statistics, you haven't carried them over, um, just because they're not required, I'm not sure is a reason not to fill them in, and that's the number of registered dogs. Is the difference between registered dogs and pet dogs the number of working dogs? Or are they uh, working in the wider sense, including farm dogs and special working dogs? That's correct, yes. It is, okay. Is there any reason why there's a change in the statistics no longer required for the total number of registered dogs? It's not. It's, n it's never been required under the DIA report. Okay. Councillor Lord. I just had a wee question of, um, involving menacing dogs. So once a dog's classified as a menace and um, it goes two years without any more complaint, does it automatically come off the menacing list or does it have to be reassessed? <coughs> Uh, generally, the classification remains with the dog for the life of the dog. Yeah. Can that be reviewed after a couple of years? Under special circumstances, it can be reviewed, yes. I did sit on one that was um, by law here in uh, and one was classification before applied, but once one has been applied, is there a way that it can be taken off? So in that particular case, the matter was reviewed after six months uh, and uh, the classification uh, was removed. So, so thinking of a particular dog that gets onto that list and then if a couple of years goes by, not, not Councillor Newell's dog, um, but uh, well, I have one of my own. So once they're on that list, they're a permanent feature. Yeah, they can't be removed even if they prove no harm. Yeah. It's a rule, that's correct, but as, I'm, as I said, there's um, different circumstances that we could look at uh, to review the classification. Any further questions? Councillor Benson Pope. I think that Councillor Wilson indicated. Oh no, you didn't. So Councillor Benson Pope's moving. Is there a seconder, please? Councillor Elder, would you wish to speak to this councillor? Are there any other speakers? There are none. I'll put all those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Well, that was easy. Right, um, 21 DC, submis DCC submission on local government funding and financing. Ms Graham and Mr Yates. Welcome. Wish to intro this, either of you? Briefly, just to say, um, Hawani has drafted our submission and is fully conversant with the 300 plus pages of the document. <coughs> um, but we're happy to take questions. So the document in question, to be clear, is the Productivity Commission's draft report, not yes. our submission. Oh, our submission's a bit shorter. Just clarifying that. <laughs> right. <laughs> Excellent. Um, right, questions, councillors? Councillor Wiley. 
Um, it was actually quite interesting to read in the sense of uh, going through the different rating systems around the country and the targeted rates and how different councils are operating in their struggles with them. What I'm looking at, was there any clear picture as you went through that that identified where Dunedin may be missing out? Um, we've drafted the submission as best we can. A, a decision like that is something that councillors are best placed to answer rather than staff. I can't, I can't see, uh, I, I definitely won't be supporting a targeted rate for petrol or anything like that, but looking through the different mechanisms was, and I'm and trying to judge from the other councils. Can, so, can, I, can I make the point that the submission is responding to the Productivity Commission's draft report? So can I suggest that if you, that the question is more, are there anything raised in the Productivity, are there any measures raised in the Productivity Commission's report rather than in general around the country? that may be of uh, interest because um, Hwani was not asked to survey uh, rating mechanisms around the country. He was asked to respond to the, the draft report of the Productivity Commission. So. I guess when I read the, went through the 300 pages, that was something. So, okay, no, I appreciate that. The um, one thing that um, I sort of looked at um, and again, trying to phrase this uh, in the, 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 the right way. Was there anything in the Productivity Commission, in, this rep in the report from the, get the words right here. From the Local Government Fund and Financing Draft Report around other financing options. And I, the thing that got me was there's a sense of KiwiSaver is a great way for um, everybody to invest in a lot of ways, but I never saw an opportunity for a KiwiSaver style fund that would be actually ethically and community <coughs> enhancing to um, be established. And is that something possibility that we could present to the report and saying as an option for investors to have a safe and secure place to invest? Well, we, as we've said, we've responded to the recommendations um, in the draft report, but if Council has other suggestions that they would like to include in our submission, that's the purpose of this discussion. But essentially that's the role filled by local government bonds, and so some Councils uh, do or have issued local government bonds, which are effectively a way of borrowing off your ratepayers, knowing that it's a debt to be returned. So that is a mechanism that's available. It's not KiwiSaver, but it's specific bonds for infrastructure bonds. And that isn't something that's canvassed in the draft report. Yeah, no, I noted that they had actually brought a group together that sort of looked at a lot of different options, but I never saw a KiwiSaver-style program there. So, okay. But that's good to know about the bonds. Mr. Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, thank you, Mr. Yates, for your very comprehensive uh, writing of the submission for Council. Um, and I see it explores a wide range of solutions and options. Um, I was particularly interested in <coughs> uh, paragraphs 23 to 26, and it was just really a process clarification. Uh, and this was under the title of Coping with the Growth of Tourism. Um, was, did, is, when you were writing that, did you consult with Enterprise Dunedin uh, as part of the process of putting this together? Yes. Thank you. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship. Um, and apologies if I missed this in the fulsome uh, report that was appended to our agenda. But uh, in, uh, in light of the suggestion around shifting the long term planning process from a three year cycle to a five year cycle, I don't recall seeing anything about amending how the annual plan process works in conjunction with that. Did I miss that, or is that is it silent on changing that? Yes, we've missed it as well. We don't recall that. We only recall the um, proposal to put the long-term plan to five years. Councillor Venice. Just an overarching uh, question. New Zealand has been slipping in terms of international productivity uh, for many years now, and we are now quite low on the list of OECD 
countries in terms of productivity. Do you see anything in this overview that you think will significantly improve levels of productivity uh, in both the private and public sectors in New Zealand? I, is all this paperwork going to actually be good for anything? I'm not sure that's a question that we can answer. Um, what we have done is provide a position on each of the recommendations in the report for Council to consider. I think I can um, to some, in some way address that insofar as the Productivity Commission has acknowledged the fact that the current reliance or over-reliance on the rating system disincentivises investment in growth infrastructure, then alternative funding mechanisms that would incentivise investment in growth infrastructure would, would arguably um, be useful in terms of increased productivity, because they would enable it. So they have, um, albeit um, obliquely, they're certainly conscious of Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you. Um, just around the suggestion that we encourage a review of the Crown's exemption, uh, rates exemption around Crown land, whether that's primary schools or universities or the conservation estate or whatever, uh, the support for that review that's outlined in the submission, is that grounded in an existing council policy? I, don't I just don't recall it ever coming up in the last six years, but it is potentially somewhat contentious. Um, it was it a specific exclusion in the terms of reference for this draft report, and so we are putting it in there because we think it is, we're suggesting that it is something that is at least worth considering as part of this process. Any further questions? None? So, oh, Councillor Wiley, take the question. Um, thank you, Worship. I actually found what I, one of the parts I was looking for. Um, trying to assist anybody. Um, about page 107, uh, there's about grants and subsidies and NZTA funding. And I note that we really accept under the um, climate adapt adaptation that we don't really focus or mention anything about NZTA funding in the 53% and the importance of it to a community. As, because it wasn't a recommendation, um, we haven't included it because our, the premise of our response is responding to the recommendations, but we're, as I said, happy to um, change the draft submission in any way that Council wants. Right, if that's all the questions, would someone like to move either the um, proposed um, resolutions on the order paper or something else? It's Councillor Aldert, you're moving what's there. Yep, seconded Councillor Wilson. Do you wish to speak to it, Councillor Aldert? I'm just um, really happy to see that we're um, asking the government to be a bit more involved and accommodate for the leader providing high quality consistent science and data, record setting standard setting and legal decision. Government creates a climate resilience agency and associated fund um, because um, there will be um, lots of uh, there's op <coughs> um, the opportunity there to cover some of the costs that um, small councils and local councils um, foreseeably may not be able to cover. So um, those were the two that, um, and there were other recommendations that I support too. So I fe felt like this was a good um, report, and our submissions were. Uh, worthy ones. So thank you for all your work. Councillor O'Malley. Um, I, I very much like this recommendation. I actually do want to bring up that idea that of, of moving the LTP out to a five-year cycle. That, that's out of whack with the um, election cycle. 
and that means that two out of five councils would be actually subject to an LTP that they weren't even able to influence. So obviously, I'm glad that we're not, you know, not going with that. Thank you. And once every 15 years, the, uh, it would be in the election year as well, which creates problems of its own. So that is that does make part of the Solgum submission, and I think the LGNZ one as well. So it is getting some attention. The speakers. Uh, well, for my part, um, I'm very supportive of this. This is an extremely important piece of work by the Productivity Commission. Um, and I, I don't mean that it's um, any better or any worse than anything else they've done, but it's particularly relevant to local government. Uh, and I note that uh, perusing it immediately after its release, that's the draft, um, Local Government New Zealand was pleased that, uh, in the main, uh, Productivity Commission had come to some very similar conclusions and were making recommendations that the local government sector has been making for quite some, more well, points that the local government sector has been making for quite some time. And I further note that there, over the last couple of decades, there have been, um, there's been more than one of this type of uh, review. And so far, and they've always come back with the same conclusions that uh, local government funding is becoming less and less sustainable whilst more and more demands are being put on it. Uh, so it is to be hoped that um, this government uh, not only listens to what the Productivity Commission recommends, but actually takes um, some action on it. Are there any other speakers? If there are none, um, Councillor Alder, you're right to reply. You're right. Okay, I'm going to put it all those in favour, please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. Thank you, Sandy. Thank you, Wani. Uh, right, on to the uh, annual review item. This is C5. This is the first of the two that, I, uh, that we brought across from. Uh, from the non-public. Oh, I crossed the wrong one out. Item 22, Tago Regional Economic Development Framework. I got ahead of myself. Um, welcome, Mr. Liggett. Mr. Christie, just about it. Had you thrown out before you were in. <laughs> just <right. laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Okay, um, do you wish to introdu introduce this? Um, oh, actually, no, I'm quite happy to take questions if you... Right, right, yeah, that, that's right. We'll just go straight to questions and you can clarify anything there. So, questions. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, um, and thank you, gentlemen. I appreciate how difficult it is to put a framework together that meets the shared ambitions uh, of all the territorial authorities in our district because they are often disparate. Uh, and and there's, um, there are, there's stronger language in some of the appendices than there are in the eventual framework. Uh, my, my question is that I can foresee, given the decision-making framework and the weighting that the attributes have, uh, something uh, meeting all of the criteria set out in this paper, uh, but still being inconsistent uh, with Council's own strategic framework. Uh, so I'm just seeking some assurance, really, that were there to be a case put to the Mayoral Forum or the Chief Executive's Forum that ticked all of these boxes, but may be somewhat counter to some of our ambitions as a city, uh, that that would still be brought back to council or a relevant committee to support or otherwise that project, not thinking of any recent mining projects in the Clutha district in particular. Yeah, we learned a bit of a lesson through um, a recent project. Um, uh, so there is a standardised process now uh, for any, for things that are seeking support from either the mayor or mostly the mayor, chief executive, provincial growth fund bids from across the region where um, uh, Fraser and his team uh, uh, have got a summary sheet that says, yep, this absolutely, this is how we assess it, scores against the Otago Regional Economic Development Framework, which really is just about how the teams work together across the councils and where there's synergies. But then it goes through to suggest areas of either positive or negative contribution to each of our strategic direction documents. And if there's any area of either uncertainty or downside, then we will put 
that then then the thing will come to council. It won't be just uh, something that gets support any other way. Despite you know this is PGF in particular where we had a, a commentary that um, that the mayor and chief executive could sign off bids now. If there's any hint that it doesn't necessarily align, we will bring it back here and we'll be risk averse around that. Further questions? I have a move. So the no Councillor Lord. So I just um, I noted in the report that there was obviously um, they've applied for PG, yeah, PGF money, and what my question is is to me some of this work I see quite a lot of benefit in being more collaborative across the region. So would this fall over if that was to come back negatively, or have you been tipped that it might come, or um, is it something that we would be prepared to put our share into to see this work continue if it was beneficial? Assuming our share would be less than 100,000 a year. Uh, look, um, we actually started this work before the PGF actually was initiated. We see a value in developing those relationships across Otago. Um, the proposal within there is something added and something good, uh, but there's a stronger value proposition than just actually looking at two years worth of funding for some advisors. So um, it's more about actually us getting together as economic development managers and units to actually look at, again, those strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats, how we can collaborate <coughs> a little bit better across the region. So. I suppose the short answer is no. I don't think it would fall over um, if that wasn't forthcoming through the application. So that if that money did come forward, it would be something that could progress at a faster rate and perhaps you'd be able to get stuck into it sort of fully committed? Uh, it'll be welcome resources and it will actually um, help actually deliver on the intent of what we're looking for within the framework. So yeah, absolutely. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, Mr. Look, can, um, apologies if I overlooked this, but uh, what would be the timing on the appointment of the Coastal Otago Portfolio Advisor? Are you anticipating? Uh, no, no, you didn't overlook that. Um, so we're looking to to get the position as filled as quickly as possible. Obviously, once we uh, get approval, um, but we're we're certainly looking in the next two to three months. That's the one that we're looking at. So again, forgive me if I've overlooked this, um, when are we hoping to get some sort of answer around approval? Uh, very shortly. <laughs> Mr O'Malley. Just following up from Councillor Hawkins' concept, uh, question about um, consistency of our own policies and, and in PAN Otago policies, would it be possible when, when, we are, when, when we're seeking a regional support for applications that, that we that we see those requests in confidential papers so that at least our eyes would be cast on them so that it wouldn't come out later that we went, oh, actually, we didn't really agree with that. There's usually a time pressure around getting these things in, so yeah. that's the reason that there is an, a, a report came up giving the Mayor and I as long as they lined up with, at that point, it was with the Otago Regional Economic Development Strategy early draft that we could we could approve them. We've subsequently amended that and advised the council that we will also check that they align up with our city council draft. So usually when we get them, we've got two or three days to to get that's them all. into government in order to meet a funding round. That's the that's the that's the difficulty we have. That doesn't mean we can't circulate them so you know what's what's going on. And in fact, we do have a process I think of letting you know from time to time. Here's the ones that are underway or in. Thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, so potentially having um, the strength, weaknesses, threats and opportunities um, identified when it comes to applying for funding for various projects, will this enable us to um, apply for funding better, you know, having more specific knowledge? Uh, I think it will in terms of applying, uh, in terms of applications and engagement with central government. Uh, a lot of regions actually have uh, a very similar type of framework to the one that we've, we've pulled together. Um, some of them actually have those reflected as strategies. So if we can articulate um, a cross district project uh, that would deliver on some of the themes that we've identified within here, it would strengthen our arm in terms of proposals to, to central government if we were going up that way. Uh, the proposal, the framework itself has been engaged with, uh, we've worked with MB on the development of this framework and again they've been really receptive in terms of actually what this could do in terms of supporting potential projects going forward with them in the future. 
Um, and I note that diversification um, of economies, um, a, number of, uh, a number of the economies across the region um, are focused on one particular area and would that enable us to identify where we need to diversify and what strengths we can build on? Absolutely. Right. Come with quick, another question. Oh no, I've already got a mover and a second it. Moved to Councillor Wiley, second to Councillor Benson Pope. Um, an unholy alliance, if ever I saw one. Um, Councillor Wiley, would you wish to speak to this in the first instance? Any other speakers? Councillor Elder. Councillor Gary. Well, I'm kind of excited about this um, cross regional um, initiative because I see lots of strengths coming out of it. And also, I can see that um, some of the links can be made stronger and some of the areas between those districts, say between Omaru and Dunedin, could get some benefits as well, some of our smaller areas. And also, some of our, um, our connections with um, Kaitahu could be strengthened and opportunities found there. And I think there's already some work going on in that space, which uh, I think will strengthen our region and enable us to have a region-wide strategy that pulls from the strengths of other places and actually attracts more people to live here and stay here and set up their businesses here. So I just think it's wonderful and I thank you for all your work and yeah, may it continue. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. Uh, I wanted to acknowledge the work of the staff, in particular Mr Liggett, because not only is this a huge piece of work over a very long period of time, uh, there, have been, there has been the piece of work on code uh, and p uh, the PGF work and business as usual as well. So thank you for your work on this, Mr Liggett, and I do see it uh, as a very welcome addition to other pieces of work we're doing. It's very timely and it suggests we're going to be stronger together and all travelling in the same way and in the same waka uh, and there's going to be some real benefits for this city. Thank you. Councillor Staines. Thank you, Worship. I'd also like to add my thanks to the team that have, in, in all the councils that have pulled this together. I'm old enough to remember Otago Forward, and perhaps if we'd had this framework then, Otago Forward might have been a more successful body, and we might have got the million dollars that government was offering if we could get our act together and think about something to do. So I think this is a real step forward. It shows a desire to start to work together for the, the region's economy and to be able to support each other in seeking funding, particularly government funding, to help take projects forward. So I think this is, this is a bit of a red letter day. Um, it pulls us together as a region and I think one of our weaknesses over the years has been that we tend to not behave as a region in a way which gives us all advantage. So when we fight each other, when we don't collaborate with each other, the outcome is never as good as when we can work together. So I think it, thank you to everyone who was involved. And Sir O'Malley. Well, just repeating what everybody else is saying, but it's united, we stand divided, we fall, and I really would recommend that if this is successful, we start to include Southland in the future. The lower part of the South Island um, working together will only basically make us stronger, and that's, this is great to see this initiative. Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Your Worship, um, and thank you to staff. Uh, having been involved in some consensus-based decision-making processes in the past, I know how difficult that can be, uh, coming to a position that <laughs> not that everyone uh, would support as their first option, but that everyone can live with, uh, and that is uh, effectively what we have before us. I mean, I think the framework is sound, and I welcome there being a, a greater sense of um, uh, regional support and regional collaboration around these issues, um, but it is still uh, disappointing to me that some of the concerns that were picked up by some participants in the early stages of this work didn't filter through prominently enough uh, in the framework and in the strategic priorities as set out in the final draft here, and that's particularly around uh, environmental uh, challenges uh, and particularly around climate change and the transition to a low carbon economy, uh, because uh, that is all we should be doing from this point, is, is focusing on that. 
uh, and the fact that that is an elevated as a key strategic theme for economic development in the region, uh, I think is, uh, is a real missed opportunity. I take heart in knowing that it's not going to uh, stop our community's aspirations and ambitions being given effect to through our own uh, broader strategic framework. And I think the strength of, um, of, of the of Council's economic development strategy is that uh, it is balanced, if you like, by all of our other strategic priorities, whether they're around social well-being uh, or the environment. And, and the risk is when you consider one of those things in a vacuum uh, without those other uh, attributes uh, weighing on the mind of decision makers, then uh, you don't necessarily get the best uh, long-term decisions uh, decisions made. So um, I'm, I, I have to remain optimistic that we'll be able to push our neighbouring territorial authorities to be a little more ambitious. Uh, in joining us uh, in our push uh, for a transition for that transition to a low carbon economy uh, and and also uh, uh, welcome the uh, the reassurances uh, that we won't uh, be that we aren't compelled to support initiatives that are counterproductive uh, to the um, to the the desires of this council in this community thanks um, for my part I um, I welcome this. Uh, it was very well received at the Otago Mayoral Forum uh, last Friday. <clears throat> and um, Councillor Hawkins' uh, reservations are, are well made. However, I took great uh, heart from the fact that for the first time, I think there's a realisation around the, uh, the various councils and the mayors that this sort of collaborative effort can be used not just uh, as a way of avoiding competition, but actually supporting one another when certain limits might be met, whether they're environmental or tourist numbers or, or whatever. And uh, I think it gives all of the, uh, all the other, all of us um, some comfort that when w one or, or two of the um, communities and councils strike some of those limits that this collaborative work can be support from the other councils can be supportive of them in perhaps diversifying or collaborating or uh, diverting tourist numbers or whatever. So we will certainly be able to address those very issues that Councillor Hawkins quite rightly points out um, better by having mechanisms to collaborate than without them. So I think from a number of points of view, I think there's some, it's a bit embryonic, uh, there's, some, there's some work to be done on that. But for the first time, I, I, I sensed around the room uh, an understanding that we could be of assistance to one another with the various challenges um, that are certainly going to confront all of our economies um, around the region. Councillor Wiley, if there's no other speakers, you'll write a reply. Um, thank you, Your Worship. Um, Yes, it was great to see this paper come to the table, and I think, you know, well done by everybody involved. It is first steps, and that's the first thing we need to remember. But it's great to bring the diversity of the thinking, the businesses, the landscape, and the people together. And this is just the start. So we've got a great, we've got a framework that is sound, and there are many steps to go but really getting the priorities identified, supported, developed, and funded will benefit the region as a whole. And I think that is what this is all about. It's all about the benefits for our city, the towns, and the communities around Otago. Thank you. Thank you. We're gonna put it all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Against, carried. Thank you, team. Okay, now we're on to C5, annual review, review, DCC Treasury Risk Management Policy. Can I invite Mr Toombs and Mr Davey up, please? Straight into Right, questions, councillors. Um, on this, there are no questions. You're happy to move, Councillor Lord. Is there a seconder, Councillor Hall? Councillor Lord, do you wish to speak to it? 
by only in so much as to say this is reviewed annually and it's, um, the changes that have been made have all been made for very good reasons and I endorse them. Other speakers? There are none. I'm going to put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. <laughs> On to Dunedin City. Um, Council's letter of expectation for Dunedin City Holdings. Um, oh, you're, you're, you're still here, Mr. Toon, yeah, yeah. and the Chief's here. Um, do you wish to introduce this? No. no, no. Uh, any questions, Councillors? Councillor Hawkins. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, a question for Mr. Toomes or the Chief Executive. Um, just trying to re recall where we got to or what the scope was of Council's resolutions around um, the living wage work. So the, the commitment. Am I right in recalling that the commitment was to come back with options around direct employed staff of the council-owned companies? Um, the, the directive was for us to uh, come up with a plan to involve both contractors and the council-controlled organisations directly approved staff, and with a plan in place, um, uh, seek accreditation, which we've done. So that, that accreditation has been granted? Yep. That's in process at the moment. We have sought accreditation, so we're expecting an, an announcement or a discussion with us imminently. Right. Um, but were we to want that to cover contracted staff at council-controlled organisations, for example, you know, service staff at Forsyth Bar Stadium who will be contracted out to Compass or whoever, that wouldn't be covered by that directive. It would require an explicit request through the letter of expectation? That's, that's right. So at the moment, um, there's a, the discussions we've had have been about meeting the requirements to get accredited, which is about their direct employees. Um, so the accreditation plan has a process in place in order to progress that work. Uh, that, those, those discussions will come back to you, and at that point in time, it will be relatively simple to raise this as another option for expiration. So... so um, the preference of staff would be for any discussion around the companies themselves to become accredited, be deferred until we have that uh, subsequent conversation? I think that would probably be the easiest way to do it, given that they are going to be looking at what they do about, um, about their own staff over the next period of time for the accreditation, for the accreditation for us. So there is a process in, uh, that enables us to have that conversation. Councillor Vandervis. I'm quite au fait with the accreditation uh, relating to our company's staff. I think that's something that is obviously that, uh, desirable and could be easily managed. I'm less, co less convinced that uh, extending this to suppliers to the companies uh, is going to be workable uh, for the same reason that I worried about suppliers to our contractors um, uh, being workable. Uh, but just to clarify this particular document, we're only looking at the direct employees of our companies at this stage. Under the current accreditation process, that's right. Thank you. Now, um, uh, under the uh, letter of expectation, uh, under two, it says that the letter does not create any legal or binding obligations of the parties. Um, and I accept that it would be difficult to create legal or binding obligations on the parties, but given that we have, if we look a wee bit further on page 141, where A, B, C, D and E relating to the companies are all um, uh, things that we... Uh, have as goals for our CCOs, and yet we have these goals being substantially not met by the companies. I'm talking, A, uh, providing a return to shareholders, not met for years, not intended to be met with some of these companies, uh, maximising a long-term sustainable dividend flow to shareholders. I'm thinking particularly of Aurora, uh, I'm looking as far into the future as I can and can't simply see one. Uh, maintain an appropriate balance between dividends and investment. Well, that would have to be the most unbalanced investment I think I've ever seen in local government. 
Uh, D, ensure that the group is fiscally disciplined with expenditure. Um, I have an extraordinary amount of evidence showing that um, some of our companies are not fis fiscally disciplined and uh, worse, are not prepared to forward the information that I've asked of the companies requiring their own manager's assessment of what value they've been uh, producing in, I'm thinking particularly, of, of the Aurora Accelerated Pole Replacement uh, um, uh, managers' uh, reports and memos. I've asked for these repeatedly. Uh, I understand that the Aurora is not subject to Lagoima, but it says here also that they are subject to their own uh, information um, uh, response uh, uh, program. And again, they haven't. They. My question, if you'll just. Bear with me, well, councillor. Yeah, we'll yes, good. Just bear with me a little longer because I'm going through a long list here of things that. That's why uh, we're looking for a question. Please get that. We are ultimately responsible for. We're ultimately responsible for their debt, and there is no legal or binding obligations for the parties to do any of the things that we ask them to do here. Now, given that there's no um, obligation for them to do them. And given that they haven't been doing a lot of these things, what recourse do we then have? What point even is there of having these kind of documents when, in the case of Aurora, they do not respond to information requests? And uh, when finally I get the Ombudsman involved and they do respond, they simply refuse to give me, as an elected representative, their own manager's reports that I ask for. What response, I mean, what levers do, they, do we then have to try and control what appear to me to be completely uncontrollable council organisations? Uh, thank you for the question. Um, the, the letter of expectation, as you can see, is addressed <coughs> to the directors of DCHL. We have the, uh, the ultimate power to remove the directors if we don't believe they're acting in the best interest of us as the shareholder. And the letter of expectation, statement of intent are tools which kind of clarify what that, the expectations are. So if I forward proof to you that in this particular case, Aurora have failed on A, B, C, D, E, G and H and uh, um, yeah, on all of those things, if I can actually produce evidence of that, will you then follow up with directors and either get them to get the information that I ask or remove them? It's can, not can, I, can I clarify here <laughs> that it's not the role of the executives? If that, if that, um, in that uh, information, and you say it's uh, evidence, that's appropriate, but you bring it to council. It's council that has the letter of expectation and if, if you can get the support of the council to go to DCHL or to, and, and through them to their companies and that you can convince council and get the support, then that's what we do. That's, but when Mr Toombs says that uh, it is for us to uh, remove the directors if we're not satisfied, he's speaking for council, this one. OK, so it would require a motion of no confidence in the current directors to be ratified by I, I, a majority I, I, of councillors. I don't know here. what the I don't know what the mechanism is, but what I'm saying well, is well, that's that, my question. Yeah, I, I would like to know what it is. No, no, I, but it, there might be a number of mechanisms. The point I'm making is it doesn't come from an individual councillor. It doesn't come from the chief executive or the chief financial officer. It comes from council. That's the only point. And whatever the mechanism is, it's, it, we're the sovereign body in this regard. So it would have to come from us. So any evidence you have, you bring it to the council to. Uh, assess and decide whether we agree to take the action that you're proposing. That would be the mechanism. And, and in what form would me bringing that evidence to you take? I don't know. You've got it, <laughs> not me. What is the process, what is the forum in which I am to present this evidence? Because I've had not much joy uh, in doing it by email so far. Um, if you have got evidence that you can bring to email, um, I, haven't, so I haven't seen any. To, to, it doesn't really matter what form you bring it in, if you've got it. 
So to clarify the process, if we as a council become satisfied that the management of one of our controlled companies is out of control and not conforming to a large number of the KPIs that we put forward here, then the process for doing something about that would be what? The process is, as you probably are aware, that council uh, uh, works through DCHL, which is the holding company, and they are the ones that, through them, we hold the companies to account. That's and if DCHL refuse to give me the information that I asked for, what do I then do? The, Mr Toombs has just said you, the council removes the directors. Um, just while I take some advice. just um, had advice that were you to want to bring something like that, you bring a notice of motion to council and uh, that and with the evidence that you um, say you have and that and then that could be assessed by council to get support for that or not. So I would take a notice of motion to the chief executive and yep. provide yeah, my under information the, under, with that. Yep, yep, you, know, you, know, okay. you know the rules. That, thank you very much for clarifying. Okay. It hasn't happened yet and I'm rather keen that something does happen. Councillor O'Malley. Um, I'm, I'm good, thanks, Bishop. Councillor Wilson. Um, I don't want to do any contra advice, it's not my place to, but I would hope that the very purpose of point two of the letter of expectation is that there was a free and frank discussion point before that anyone had to do a notice of motion. Notice of motion is a rather uh, end result, one direction action. That I'm sure that the whole point of this statement of intent is that this stuff is. Um, discussed between the DCHL and Free and Frank. And so the question I have is, have we, how often do we, we, uh, we have opportunities to have Free and Frank discussions with DCHL directors or the chairman? Uh, at the moment there are um, structured and organised quarterly meetings um, with the CEO of DCHL. When was the last one? Uh, I believe about three or four hours ago. And would have that been an opportunity for the discussion that we've just had questioned on, been the time to bring that matter to, uh, uh, as part of the statement of intent? Because the statement of intent is two ways. It's not just something DCHL has to do. It's something that the councillors should be doing themselves. Yes, yeah, so there is generally a question and answers two ways between DCHL and councillors about all operational and strategic issues, yes. And it is important to note that what was presented at the meeting today was an outline of exactly, I mean, I think there would be debate over A, B, C, D, whether those things are being met. Um, issues like long-term after-tax return to the shareholders doesn't mean in the last three years since they've been trying to put, for, put right the, the, the difficulties of the past or the lack of maintenance of the past, uh, maximise long-term sustainable dividend flow, they would argue they're doing that. So th there's a matter of how you would have those dis discussions. Today's workshop was an opportunity to do that. The, the point that the leader is saying this letter sets no, has no standing, and, and it's the letter says this is what we want to see in your statements of intent. They come back with a statement of intent, they come here, and we have that debate. That's the point at which Mr. Crombie sits up there, and we have a discussion with him about whether they are meeting these objectives. Oh, sorry, not Mr. Crombie. Yeah, apologies. Um, Keith sits up the front and we have that discussion about whether they are meeting th those objectives and we start to be a bit tighter about what we expect to see if there's concern. Right, Councillor Hawkins. Thank you, Worship. And without wanting to preempt anyone's campaign strategy, I'm, I'm quite nervous about whether discussions going around notices of motion or otherwise, particularly as it, the discussion inevitably would pertain to the performance of individuals uh, and, and whether or not the chief executive can make a determination upon receiving receipt of a notice of motion for it to be debated in the non-public part of a meeting. I've never, that can be done, uh, and that it, but that would be a determination delegated to the chief executive rather than the elected member lodging it. Excellent, thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you, Your Worship. I just want to uh, clarify if Mr. Toombs would do so, um, particularly in the context of number two and following on from my colleague Councillor Wilson's question, um, if there was a matter in between those regular meetings that arose uh, that was needing to be raised with DCHL, what would that process look like for an elected member, please? 
I might seek some guidance on that, but I think the, the current relationships are parties are happy for that to be informal or formal. Um, so we, we have a monthly catch-up. So uh, at, at that point in time, uh, the Mayor goes, I go, um, uh, Mr Lord goes, um, the Chairman of Finance CCO's Committee, and any issues can be raised through that process. So just in theory, if I had a matter I wanted to raise and elect a member and I was concerned about something with the CCOs, I could uh, raise that with Mr Cooper and uh, pass that along the chain. Would that be correct? My suggestion is that the appropriate person to raise it with would be, in the first instance, the Chair of Finance and uh, CCOs, and uh, through him or her uh, <coughs> work, work that way, rather than going direct to the Chair. Just and, and or myself, I'm, I'm in regular contact with the DCHL governance group, so, yep. Councillor Benson Pope. Thank you, Worship. Mr Toombs, just a simple question. Um, can you enlighten us, please, about the response of the chairman of the holding company at today's meeting when Councillor Vandervis raised his shopping list of concerns? So can I summarise Mr Cooper's response? That Councillor Vandervis wasn't there this morning. Oh. <laughs> right, Councillor Newell. Oh, you, so are there any other questions? Councillor Vandervis. The reason I wasn't there this morning is that I'm in receipt of a lot of information that I have got independent of DCHL about some of the companies, information which if uh, Councillor, is this, this a question? Because we, you can bring this up in the discussion around Okay, this. I'll bring it up in discussion then. My question on page 141 relates to uh, uh, item 8. Use the insurance broker and tax advisor appointed from time to time by the Council. I'd like to know who appoints the insurance broker and tax advisor in the Council and who are our current insurance brokers and tax advisor? Okay, both both them organisations are appointed as a result of a competitive tender process that we conduct every for memory three years before before my time here. Is we DCHL? Uh, there's there's a representative from council, a representative from DCHL, on both on both. And DTL. Yeah. I can't actually I can't comment about what happened last time because I say I wasn't here, but we're putting the paperwork together now, and there is a representative from DCHL, stroke DCTL, and council, and a third one. And, some of, and one of our, our procurement specialists as well. So who would the council representative be then? In um, myself or my two I see in finance, yeah. Okay, and who are the current uh, insurance broker and tax advisor? That, uh, that well, we I don't be that's commercially sensitive, is it? No. Current ones aren't. Yeah, no. Uh, Crombie Lockwood, the insurance, uh, insurance. and uh, I, don't check that. I don't deal with the tax ones directly, but I think it's Deloitte's. I'll have to get back to you on that one if I can. That'd be great. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Yeah. Right, if there are no further questions, can I have a mover and seconder for this? Move Councillor Staines. Seconded Councillor Lord. Mr Councillor Staines, do you wish to speak to it? Councillor Lord, do you wish to speak to it? No. Further speakers? Councillor Vanders. Clarify the issue on why I didn't attend, specifically didn't at attend this morning's DCHL verbal briefing, in which there are no minutes taken, and in which, uh, in the past, when I have attended such briefings, have been given information which has then, which has been uh, supposedly um, non-public, and which I've then not been able to use. Uh, in the public, even though I had the information prior to being advised. Uh, the very hostile environment that I have uh, Cou faced... Ca often Councillor, can I urge you to speak to the motion? The motion talks about our companies... Yeah, it's a letter of expectation, so... A letter of expectation and how we are supposed to actually achieve uh, these various points. I'm talking particularly of, of the... KPIs, if you like, the ideals, the returns that we want to see from the companies. And the achievement of them in the past has been either not at all or not substantial, in my view. We've had no dividend 
for years. We've got no dividend coming for years. We have enormous investment required by the companies, the liability for which this council has to take on. And the, uh, even when we were getting dividends from the companies, my understanding is that a lot of the dividends were simply borrowed money in any event. So we have a long history of supposedly council-controlled companies who weren't well controlled, who didn't answer questions appropriately that I've put to them. And under this letter of expectation, they are supposed to give us information when we ask for it. And my point is that despite the horrors of the past, this is still currently going on. I'm still getting stonewalled in trying to get even the most basic reports about the latest, for instance, accelerated pole replacement program. I know the reports exist. I've been told about them by Richard Healy. I have a pretty good idea of what's in them. And yet the companies absolutely point blank refuse to let me see them uh, on, on either a confidential or a public basis. Uh, I believe that I should be able to see them on at least a confidential basis, probably on a public basis as well, given that uh, they relate to work that was done last year, uh, that there's no possible um, commercial sensitivity regarding any contracting around them now. It's all been and done. Um, I want to see these reports because they go to the heart of why the companies are spending enormous amounts of money for which we are ultimately liable and we are not getting an adequate return from it. There is evidence in these reports of extraordinary levels of waste. Um, and, and my worry is that we just tick this off, that the paperwork is all straight and it says what should happen. But what actually happens is nothing like it, hasn't been anything like it in the past and continues to be nothing like it now. So I can vote for this. I think that the changes that are in red are actually positive. Um, I agree that all of the um, uh, things that are uh, suggested that we should get from the companies in this, re in this uh, report, in this letter of expectation, are actually quite appropriate. My worry is that, going back to two, there's no legal or binding obligation of the parties and they can simply continue not to perform, not to give us information and in fact not to be in control by this organisation that is ultimately liable for it. Councillor Wilson. I'm concerned, Your Worship, that there have been some suggestions made of process that um, really should be a, 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 we should be able to ask some questions of uh, Mr Toombs about in light of what's just been said and uh, whether you're going to leave to ask some questions before I speak or not. Um, I know I, it's unusual. I'm not, um, I'm not prepared to have unsubstantiated allegations cross-examined in, uh, in this environment without uh, some preparation. In, in e normally, uh, if, if there were some basis for questions, it, we'd have a report or something. Councillor Vandervis has made some allegations. He's perfectly at liberty to, to make them, but they're completely unsubstantiated, and I'm not going to have them cross-examined in a vacuum of, of information now. Oh, and, and look, I totally understand that. My concern is that they've been left hanging as if they are true. Um, when oh, if, I, 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 that's not I, uncommon. What? It's not particularly helpful, though, either. Um, then my statement. Then I will make a statement to the motion. I will be supporting this motion, and I thank the um, staff for not only circulating this well and truly beforehand, and enabling many of us to make comments on it and to um, change it and <coughs> raise any other issues. But being very aware, and I want to state very clearly that we ha are very fortunate to be governed very well by staff at a number of levels who we can take issues to. And I have had discussions along those lines if there are issues and we get answers suitably. I would like to support the, both the directors but also the staff who we have as conduits for that and to say thank you to you for being responsive, for getting back to us, not immediately or sometimes, but for responding to those matters and being able to address them. And that we have very good, I think, um, dialogue with the companies um, now more than ever, potentially, um, with changes that have been made, and that I th um, would like to thank you for the roles that you have to do, um, ensuring that we do get responses. Councillor O'Malley. 
I want to thank Mr. Toombs and his staff for this work on this letter. Um, I think we probably often suffer from the definition of the actual entities that we own as council controlled organisations. Our level of direct control is, is relatively indirect and it's actually through these documents that we, we try to have a global feeling of how these companies operate but we don't have much control over the day to day because of many acts of parliament including the Companies Act. So. Um, I think this is the best we can do. I'm very happy with this document, and I would prefer that these things were known as council-owned organisations, <laughs> because then I think we'd have a better understanding of exactly our relationship with them. Thank you. Councillor Gary. Thank you. Thank you, Your Worship. Um, I'll be supporting this motion, and I want to take issue with uh, what our colleague, Councillor Vandervis, uh, noted, he, he said we just tick these things off, and I take issue with that because we have had every chance to ask searching questions, including this morning. Um, and I want to just give as an example, uh, if elected members have an issue, there is a process to follow, which I have recently experienced. So um, we have all had situations where members of the public have raised matters with us and uh, frequently over the last triennium around council-controlled companies, I'm sure. There is a process for that, it's a very clear process, um, and uh, through Mr Toombs, uh, to the chair of DCHL, um, the matter is raised appropriately, no issue at all, and the person raising the issue uh, can meet directly with the DCHL chair and raise that matter. So there is a process, it's, it's, it's not a big deal, it, it can be done, it, it requires uh, the elected member to act responsibly um, and not go down the conspiracy theory pathway. Uh, so I'm very comfortable to support uh, this, I think it's very thorough, uh, and I appreciate the work and advice of Mr Toombs and his staff. To the speakers. Well, in supporting this, uh, I just want to put a little bit of context uh, around this, uh, especially in light of the uh, claims that Councillor Vanderbilt has made. Go back um, a good eight or nine years now, when uh, it became obvious only a few months after the stadium was built that DCHL and its companies certainly couldn't provide the dividend streams that had been promised and required. Uh, subsequent to that, we did a complete review and we disestablished the board and we put a holding board in and then we started a process here of developing uh, much more stringent controls and considerably more transparency in the process. Um, and I recall that in the development of statements of intent, um, various councillors asked for more than just the uh, give us the most money. Uh, there was um, a reference to um, social wellbeing outcomes, etc., aligning uh, the, uh, the aims of the companies with the uh, strategic aims of the council uh, right across the board. And that strengthened over time. Um, I think we're, we're still on that journey. Uh, I, I think that um, each time, and we didn't even have letters of expectation some time ago, we just, we just went to them and said, um, fire off your, your SOI, uh, and we'll have a look at it, and generally it was ticked off, and that wasn't uh, adequate, and uh, so to that extent, uh, I agree with Councillor Vandervis, the situation then was, um, was less than ideal. But to say that it hasn't changed is, is patently ludicrous. It clearly has changed. We didn't even have the opportunity, as has been pointed out by another councillor in the past, to uh, front up to the directors. We just, we, half the time, we didn't even know who they were. Uh, so the, the situation is considerably better now. With regard to getting information from companies, uh, just because um, one uh, councillor is denied some information that he or she might want doesn't mean they have a right to it. Uh, the Aurora can, um, says that it endeavours to stick within the rules that would govern it if it were subject to Lagoima, uh, and has, I know, on occasion explained to you uh, in emails why they wouldn't 
uh, give you some information. And were they subject to Lagoima, if their argument is um, substantiated, then they wouldn't be given to you either. So the fact that information is denied doesn't mean that it ought to have been given and that individual councillors have a right to all information within the companies. We don't. Um, but we do have mechanisms to find out things, as Councillor Gary has said, and the offers are made frequently, come in on a confidential basis and we'll, um, we'll, we'll give you that information. So I think this is uh, yet another step along the way of um, better uh, transparency and better accountability and, uh, from our companies. And might I point out that what we hold them to account uh, in is not the letter of expectation, it's actually the statement of intent. That's what we hold them accountable for and that's what they, we expect them to, to come back uh, with and I look forward to uh, constructive uh, suggestions uh, when that comes back as to how that can be made as, as robust as possible. Right, so Councillor Staines, do you wish your, to exercise your right of reply? I'll, I'll put it. All those in favour, please say aye. 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 Against? Carried. Now, well, that's the last of the public items, so I'm going to move from the Chair that the me meeting move into confidential for the reasons outlined in the agenda. Uh, second to Councillor Staines, all those in favour please say aye. Aye. Against? Carried. And I'm going to um, suggest that we come back in quarter of an hour. That gives us time to have a well-earned break and let the camera crew uh, demount. So we'll be back here quarter to um, oh, no, 10, 10 to 4.